I need to uh, tell you something funny, follow up from a story how I began messes last week. If you weren't here, I opened up with a, with a confession of an issue in my life. And I've got an issue of uh, when I drive, I tend to get distracted uh, about other things that I think are really cool. Buildings, signs, uh, sports cars, you name it. I, I just I easily get distracted. And where my eyes go, my hands go, the steering wheel goes, the car goes. And sometimes we kind of go into other lanes off the road. It, it, it's kind of crazy. And so, um, and then now I helped tell you that story last week to introduce the message. Well, this week, Aggie and I had the privilege to go to a friend's church in uh, western Louisiana to preach at a, um, a group of services they have they start off each year with, and I got to go in and close it out. And it was really good, and so we spent the night there and came back Thursday morning. We're driving back, and so it was, it was about an hour above Lake Charles, and so we're coming back on I-10, and, and uh, we were about probably um, two hours in, maybe. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I have, I have a car that has all the, the, the bells and whistles and warnings, and, and now I get messages on my screen of, it tells when I'm running low on gas. Hey, do you want, to, want me to find you a fuel place? I mean, it's, it's, it's just so funny, you know, just, and, and, and it's great, I guess. And so one thing, all of a sudden, I hear this beep, and I'm like, what's the beep for? And I look on my little screen, it says, do you feel you need a rest right now? Because apparently I had been wandering all over the road. <laughs> And can I just tell you, my wife got the biggest kick. She starts texting everybody. <laughs> Let me tell you what Randy's car said, because they all know I weave all over the place, you know. And so, <laughs> it was so funny. And uh, I, 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 was, I, I was half laughing, half like, come on, man, you know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But we're going to continue today in our message series uh, that we're calling Let's Grow. And where this comes out of, God had has given us a mandate for 2022, a vision statement for us to grow. And that that affects all of us. God wants us growing. And really, that's a state of being in our life that we never become still or stagnant, that we're always growing. And so I want to put up the definition that we've seen of what uh, growing is. It's it's to become something more. It's to become better, stronger, healthier, healthier more effective, more capable, more fruitful, more mature, that that our life just keeps growing, growing and growing, getting better and better. And what we learned last week is that, uh, and that kind of goes with my story of where my eyes tend to go, is that you go toward what you focus on. What you're looking at, what you're thinking about, that's where your life is going to go. In fact, where your life is right now, it's a product of what you have been focusing on. I don't like hearing statements like that when my life isn't where I want it to be, because ultimately that pins it on me. I like blaming other things. I don't. Want, I don't want to take take the 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 fall. I want. I want it to be somebody else. Something else. That thing happened. This person did that. But the reality is, my life is where it is because of my choices, which come from what I focus on. So what's the key statement is that we learned last week is that you grow upward. And upward means closer to God, more like God, better and better. We grow upward by focusing forward. That our eyes are focused in the right direction. And when we do that, what happens is we grow upward. Last week I put a diagram of an upward spiral. As we move forward, what's happening is we're growing actually upward, closer to God. More like what He wants us to be. And our life is just getting better and better and healthier and stronger. We're improving. But there's an intentional decision we have to make of what we're choosing to focus on. And last week we dealt with some things that may get attached to our life that are really keep either pulling our focus or pulling us back to where we should not be. If there's things that we attach to our heart that will get our attention because the eye sees what the heart loves. And so if we have these loves in our heart that are other than God, what happens is they're going to get our attention. And the problem is that's the direction our life is going to go. 
And it's going to keep us from going forward and upward to the life that God has for us. If you missed the last couple weeks' messages, you can go catch those online. And I encourage you to do so because they're foundational to all that we're going to talk about the next few weeks. But I want, to, want you to catch this thought. Is that forward means looking toward God. That's, that's what when we, we're talking about. Focusing forward is focusing toward God. That's His Word, His ways, His promises. But last week we talked about focusing forward. But what happens when you can't see the future by doing it God's way? What happens? What happens when God says, take this step, and you can't tell what that's going to look like in your life in reality? When God gives you a decision to make, and you want to say yes, but you can't see right there in front of you. And I have to be honest, that's the challenge of what God tells us sometimes. He always doesn't show us the future. He just says, take the step. He just says, take a step forward. But we can't see. Maybe it's something we read in the Bible. And God says, I want you to do this. And we know it's in his word, which applies to everybody. Sometimes it's personal, but sometimes it's just a general thing for us as Christians. And it's like we want to. We know it's the right thing to do, but what does my look, life look like if I do that? What happens? What happens to my family, my finances, my job? What does this mean? Last week's message, easy message to preach. Yeah, focus forward. Man, we're going forward. But when you can't see it, then how do you move forward? How do we take those steps? That's what today is about. And really what the next three weeks is about. Is we're going to learn the power of a truth in God's word. To help us take those steps forward. We can't see the future. And guys, today's message is foundational for your entire Christian journey. This is one of these core messages. That really affects everything you do in your Christian journey. Everything. We read this week in our, our one-year Bible, and for those of you who are new, what we're doing this year is we're reading through the, the entire Bible together in one year. We're using a format called the One Year Bible, and I'd love for you to join us. It's been so good. Uh, people have been hearing all kind of great things from God, and, and God's showing them truth. has been sending them to me. And by the way, if God gives you something really cool, send it to me. Uh, send, email it. My email is randy at liv.church. Send it to me. I'd love to hear what God is showing you. And so this week, we've, we've read about two amazing people. One we've talked about before, really everybody knows about, and his name was Abraham. He's the father of our faith, amazing man of God. And we know the story that God said, hey, I want you to leave your homeland, leave your family, and I want you to go uh, to a place you've never been before, you don't even know about. Imagine God telling him that. And he's in his comfort zone. He's familiar. He, he's, he was a man already of wealth. He knew the area, how everything worked, knew the people. But yet God says go. And he took that step forward, not knowing what it was going to look like. Hebrews 11.8, which is a chapter on faith, describes it this way. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. I love that. I, I'd, love for, I'd love for when somebody describes my life. Maybe it's at the end of my life. Maybe it's at my funeral. It says, by faith, Randy, when he was called, obeyed. He just obeyed. He just said yes to the Lord and just did it. My, my, some of my favorite verses in the Bible, when God says do something, it says, early that, the next morning they arose. I love that. I'm like, Lord, that's where I want to be. You say it, 
I just, all right, let's go. I don't think about it. I don't debate it. I don't question it. I don't sit on it. I don't go, well, God, what does that look like? How about this deal? What about this? I don't go through all the details. I just go, yes, you got it. I want to be that man. And said he obeyed by going out to a place which he was received as an inheritance. And I want you to remember that word inheritance. You're going to see that today again. And he went out, but look at this, not knowing where he was going. He didn't know. God just said go. He didn't know where he was going. How amazing is that? Couldn't see the future. But yet God said, and he just focused his eyes to the direction God wanted him to go, and he went forward. And we knew his life. His life would be an upward journey of great things. There's another story that was in it. It's actually a a relative of Abraham. Abraham had a son named Isaac, and he wanted him to have a good wife, didn't want him to have a wife from the area they were living in. So he sends his servant back to his homeland to go get a wife from his homeland, from his relatives. So the servant goes, gets, packs up all his stuff, goes on a journey, which they figure was about two months. And the servant does pretty amazing. He prays to the God of Abraham, said, God, I'm asking for favor. I'm asking you to make this real plain. And he laid out what he was looking for. He said, God, here's how I'm going to know you're answering my prayer. And and God does it exactly that. Meets a woman named Rebecca and uh, goes back to her family. He tells them the God story. He He tells them what God had done, how God had brought him there. And they're all just listening, and they all agree it's God. They said yes. And so uh, the, Rebecca's family says, yes, we're good with her going. And so the servant says, hey, I'm ready to go back. I, I found her. Let me get back home and bring the job I was supposed to do. Let me finish it. And they're like, no, we want to hang out with her for a little while. Don't take her so quick. He says, no, I want to get back. And I love what what Rebecca's response is, Genesis 24, 58. They go to her, and they said, hey, what do you want to do? Will you go with this man tomorrow morning, just rise up early and leave? And look at what she says. I will go. Leaving her family her comfort place, her homeland, the life that she probably thought she would live to a future she doesn't know, to a man she's never met, to a place she's never been. goes totally against probably what her thought of her future was, but yet she makes this amazing statement. I will go. What did she do? Focused her eyes forward on God. She heard the God story and said, yes, I will do it. So I want you to see this statement. I'm, I'm actually going to have a few statements really to set the foundation of today. And this is where some of these statements may be a little bit challenging to you. But the first one is, is that you move forward by keeping your eyes on God. We know that. Now we're going to add to it in full faith. In what he said. Full faith. God says it. My response is, I will go. I'll rise up early tomorrow morning and I will go. I will not delay. I will not doubt. I will not ponder. I will not argue. I will not reason it out. I will go. But we have a problem, don't we? And I'm going to use this word to describe our problem. We're human. We're human. Human. So what you see this thought is that human faith only believes what it can see, what it can taste, what it can feel, smell, reason, what we can logically work it out inside of us. And, and, and guess what? Our enemy encourages that. He wants us to live in the reasoning. Because a lot of times in the reason, we'll reason ourselves out of the will of God. That just don't make sense. 
I've, I've, heard, I've heard people talk about God said give like this supernatural amount. Like clear out your savings account. Clear out your wallet. And their first response is, I rebuke you devil in the name of Jesus. You know? Why? They're, they're reasoning it out. Well, God would never want me to do that. God asks us to do some very challenging things. And so the enemy kind of works in that realm. Remember what he did to Eve? Did God really say that? Did, did he really? And Eve starts reasoning, well, he said this. But then she looked at what looked good. Well, what God's want me to do, that don't look good. That don't feel good. I don't like what I see. And all of a sudden we reason it out. But what does it do? It leads to a life outside of God's will. Ultimately, it leads to things like despair and defeat, confusion, negativity, and fear. Some of y'all are living in that world right now. Some of you are honest about your life. It, it, it's not in the will of God because you, you, you've said no to what he's told you to do. He told you to do something challenging. Take a step forward. And you hadn't done it yet. And you're facing the consequences. There's no peace inside of you. You know you're outside of his will. And you can come to church all you want. Read your Bible all you want. Pray all you want. But the only way you will find what God has for you is to say, yes, I will. The only way you'll get the inheritance that, like Abraham was promised, by saying, yes, I will go. Is it hard? Of course it is. But isn't that the journey? So tough. But it's so much better when we do it God's way. So here's the next thought. Is that when it comes to God, we must believe things that we cannot see yet. So hard. But the promise, the result is the promises of God becoming real in our lives. I look at the Bible, and it talks about these great things. And y'all, I want all of them. I want everything that God says is available to me and my family. I want it for you. I don't want anybody missing out on God, all that God has. I want them real in my life. That's the life God intended. He, he did it for reasons. the life I want you to have. I don't want you missing out on it. But what does it do? We've got to believe things we can't see. We have to be willing to take that step forward. I saw this quote this week that says, It is your faith in God that determines how much of his blessings you will enjoy. It's your faith that determines how much you receive. It's not a God issue. God already has it. And actually, if, if you read the truth of it, God's already given it. It's just literally sitting there on the table. Faith just reaches out and grabs it and receives it. Imagine somebody, you had a birthday party and somebody leaves a gift on the table. But you leave without taking it with you. That's you. The giver gave the gift. That's you. But why this message is part of the growth series? It's because faith not only is the starting point for our Christian journey, but it's also the driving power that propels us forward. Where's our Christian journey starts? By faith in Jesus. That he was real. That the work he did was real. That the work he did was for me. That's where it begins. We begin our journey with God by faith. But that's how everything continues. Sometimes I, I think it's like we start with faith and then the rest is what we do after that, our work. No, it's faith upon faith Upon faith, after faith, and more faith, and increasing faith, and still more faith. 
everything. And look, I, I've been in a journey for two weeks on faith. Can I just tell you? That's part of my own journey. It's an area God says I need to grow even more in. And, and, and I've, been, I've been listening to all kind of people who are experts in faith, who live it out. You see it in their life. And one of them said, you, don't do, you do everything in your life by faith. Every step you take is by faith. Every breath you take is by faith. When you lay your head down at night, that's faith. And I was like, hey, hard to lay my head down on a pillow at night. He says, do you believe God's going to give you rest? Do you believe God's promise he's going to give you sleep? Do you believe God's promise he's going to give to you while you sleep? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So every night I've been submitting my night. I literally get before the Lord and say, Lord, I give you my night. I give you my life. I give you my mind, my dreams. And I know you're giving me rest. I know you're giving me sleep. I know when I lay my head down at night, you're going to give me sleep. I just know it. it. It touches every part of our life. So what is faith? Hebrews 11.1, 1, which is the chapter on faith, it, it defines it this way. Faith is the, look at this, this word, assurance. Assurance. It's a knowing. You're sure of it. Assurance of things hoped for. And we're going to dive into that in future messages. Things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Some of you have convictions. Nobody can change your mind. That's what faith is. There's a conviction to it. But look at the key. You can't see it. You can't see it with your natural eyes. But yet there's a conviction about it. No, I know what God told me. Man, you crazy. I don't care what you say. God told me. Yeah. What is that going to look like? I don't care. I don't know. God said, and I will go. There's a conviction there. It's faith. So let me give you a few words to kind of describe faith. It's, it's words like trust. Trust in God. It, it's confidence. It's certainty. It's a knowing. It's no doubt. What's interesting to me, I watch people have faith in the things of this world, but they don't have as much faith in God. They have faith. They show up at work tomorrow. They're going to get a paycheck. You're counting on man. There's no, look, there's no guarantee they're going to have money to pay your paycheck. But you just go knowing that you just know it, that money's going to be in my bank account. But yet we won't trust God for the smallest of things that he's promised already. So what is biblical faith? It's trusting God who we do not see to do the things that he's promised. That's faith. It's a trust. It's a trust. The difficult thing with God is we can't see Him. But we look and we trust Him that what He says is real. And what I mean by real is real for my life. That when you look at it, you go, it's real for me. It's not real for the world. For churches, for Christianity in general, it's personal for me. God's saying it to me. That's biblical faith. A pastor said it this way. He said, without faith, the substance that God has for you in the invisible realm, invisible realm, will never be yours in the visible realm. The power of faith isn't based on who you are. It's based simply on who God is. And here's the challenging statement. Your faith is as big as the God you believe in. I know who God is. I believe in him. Then I have some why questions for you. About why aren't you doing certain things? That God said do. So here's a challenging thought. Is that you receive from God. Based on the God you choose to believe. And I heard this quote. I'm not sure who said it. The God you see. Is the God you get. 
Man, we're talking about focusing forward. But we have a choice to see God for who he is or not. In the Bible, there's different stories who, to help us understand of how people saw God and the results that came from it. We know the Israelites that left Egypt. They chose to really have a complete lack of faith in God. They put some faith in Moses, but there was no faith in God. And it, and it cost them. It kept them from receiving the inheritance God had for them. And Hebrews 3.19 describes it this way. It says, so we see that they were not able to enter into the promised land. Look at this. Because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. That they chose not to believe God was who he was and that what he said was going to happen to them. They chose not to believe. It cost them to wander for 40 years and cost them from going into the promised land. Why? Because they saw God as, as either non-existent or insufficient or a liar. But there were some people who saw God a different way. And I, I, I want to read this out of our one-year Bible reading for this week. Matthew 9 has, has, has some um, four stories about five people who chose to see Jesus for who he really was. In Matthew, Matthew 9, 22, it, it, it talks about this woman who had had this issue in her body for many years. Doctors couldn't heal it. In fact, what the, the, the solutions they gave her made it worse. Can anybody relate to that? And y'all been at the hands of doctors. It's like just gotten worse, right? Um, but, but, but she goes to Jesus, and it says, and she says she's just going to believe him. She, she trusted who he was. And Matthew 9, 22 says this, Jesus' response to her. He says, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. Your faith. And at once the one was healed. But who does she see Jesus as? The healer. She'd gone, oh, these, oh, these people have promised healing. They couldn't do it. So she said, I'm going to go the one I know can. She knew it. In fact, she said, I don't even need to pray over me, talk to me, anoint me with oil. I just need to touch just the edge, just the edge of his clothes. If I can just get my finger on it, I will be healed. She just reaches out, the crowd gets down there, and boop, healed. And Jesus noticed it. Well, who, why? She saw Jesus for who he really was. Another was two blind men. I heard Jesus was coming. And they're like, we got to get to Jesus. Matthew 9, 28. And when Jesus had entered the house, the blind men came up to him and said, came to him, and Jesus said, do you believe, look at this, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said, yes, but look at their response, Lord. Who were they saying? I know who you are. You're God. I know you. I, know. I can't even see you with my natural eyes, but I know you. And he goes on to say, he touched their eyes, saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith. They saw Jesus for who he really was, as Lord and healer. Therefore, they got all that God wanted for their life. So let me continue the thought of our thought on biblical faith. Biblical faith is trust in the true God. So I got some kind of questions here. Get you thinking. Is your faith in a God you've created? In a God maybe somebody told you about? Or in the God of the Bible? Hebrews 11.6 says, He who comes to God must believe that He is. And that's important. That's a descriptive statement of God is everything. God is everything He says He is. God is all that and a bag of chips. He's everything. But if we come to God, that's what we have to believe him as. Or else we will not receive what God has. 
Numbers 23, 19 says this. says, God's not a man. That he shall lie or a son of man, he should change his mind? Does he speak and then not act? No, that's what people do. Does he promise and not, not fulfill? No, that's what happened to us. That may be what we do. But that's not what God does. So if God doesn't lie, in fact, he's incapable of lying. He doesn't break his promises. Why would we not believe him? <coughs> Romans 4.21. Talk about Abraham again. This is being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. perform. Look at this. He said assured. He just knew. He knew. He knew who God was and he knew God would. Therefore, he received all that God had. Faith. And I know this is challenging. So let me real quickly, I'm going to go through these next three points and verses very fast. But I want to just give you a point of why faith. Why faith? It's important that you know this. The first one, it's necessary to please God. It's how you please God. You want to be pleasing to God? Faith. Faith is where it starts. Hebrews 11, 2. It says, for by faith, the men of old gain approval. It's how they're approved before God. It goes on to say, verse 6, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. Not of works can please him if it's not rooted in faith. Because faith determines and dictates everything that we do. Remember I talked about the Israelites that just didn't believe God. Look at God's response in Numbers 14 and 11. So the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people spurn me? How long will they not believe in me despite all of the signs which I have performed in their midst? Like, how much more do I have to do to get them to believe me? I've done things over and over and over again. I think that's a valid question for us. We see God move, see God move, see God move, see God move. But yet, when we come to a point of decision, we're going, oh, God. And God's going, <laughs> how much more? I've done all these things in your life and others. All around you, you see it. Why won't you just believe me that I'm God and I will? I will. And you just, it's like in that verse, you can just hear, it's like his discouragement. It's like, I wonder how many times I've been that way. God said, do something. And I've seen you move over and over. I don't. And God's just going, believe. Second reason why faith is necessary for your daily life. Habakkuk 2.4 said this way, the righteous will live by faith. Just, just right there, plain and simple. Plain and simple. And, and Abraham is the father in our faith, and that's what Romans 4.12 says. What we do, we follow in the steps of faith. Remember, we're talking about focusing forward. We're moving forward. Those steps of faith, forward which our Abraham had while, while uncircumcised. Before, before God even made one big covenant with him, he just was already moving forward in God. But then let's take that a step further in Amos 3.3. Do two walk together unless they've agreed to do so? How can you walk with God if you're not in agreement with who he is and what he's promised for your life? It's not possible. It's not possible. Faith is our agreement with God. So here's a thought is that you cannot get to God without faith and you cannot get from God without faith. And that leads us to our third point of why faith is necessary to receive God's promises. In James, a well-known verse, and it's talking about wisdom. He said, if you, if you want wisdom, ask God. He'll, he'll give it to you. Look what it says in verse 7, because it's foundational to our walk with the Lord. He says, he, go, go back to uh, verse 6 for, for me. He said, but when you ask God, when you come to God, he said you must ask in faith without any doubting. They, they can't be intermingled. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, is driven by the wind, tossed back and forth. Man, I don't want that life. Look, I love going to the beach. I love getting in the waves. I love getting thrown around. I think it's real cool. Waves knock you over. I don't want that for my everyday life. 
Vacation's cool. Monday through Friday, they good. I want finances all back and forth. My life with God all back and forth. My relationships all back and forth. Man, I want a nice, stable, peaceful life. I was telling somebody this week that they have a, a, a relative, I'll say it this way, who has the, the craziest stories of life happening to them. And I said, you know what? I hear those stories. I laugh that I go, God, thank you for my simple, peaceful life. I just live it in God, trusting he's got my life, my every step. And it's led me in a good life. So peaceful, so good. It's not without trouble. But even when trouble comes, I just go, God, that's yours. I keep my eyes on you. I'm not looking at the trouble. But it goes on to say in verse 7, that man ought not to, re- to expect he receive anything from the Lord. Oh, no faith, no receiving. No faith, no receiving. Serious message today, isn't it? But let me reiterate what I began at the beginning. For you, it may be a message of truth and dealing with some things, but it's not a message of condemnation. It's a message of encouragement. Because if you relate to some of these things today, you're going, ooh, that's me. We can grow. We can get to where we're supposed to be. And that's where we're going to go in the next few weeks of our faith journey. We're actually going to learn how to increase our faith because faith is in levels. So we can grow our faith to get it what it should be. But while we're in this moment now, I want you just to bow your head and close your eyes. If you're watching online, right where you are, just bow your head. It's just a time of reflection. The first question is, how's your faith in God? How would, how, how would you describe it? What's the, what's the truth of your faith? What, what, what's, your, what's your perspective about God? Like, what's your belief about God? We can all in church talk about the God of the Bible, but is the God of the Bible the God in your mind and in your heart? Is that the real God for you? Is there anything you need to change? Now's the time to do it. That's why we're here in church. This is the place. I encourage you, don't leave today. Without getting right what you need to get right. And my third question is, Have you actually surrendered your life to Jesus? In in other words, is God a part of your life? He's got so much for you, wants to do so much in you. But he can't if he's not a part. And you can't receive what God has if you're not with him. And today you realize, I'm not with the Lord, but I want to be. You're ready to make that decision to follow him. With nobody looking, please, in this room. Let's just let this be a private moment. If you're in this room today, and I'm going to pray for everybody in just a moment, but I'd love to pray for you if you want to make that decision for Jesus. If that's you in this room, I just want you to lift your hand real high for me. Just lift it up. Lift it up. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. I see you. Why don't you all just put your hands out in front of you like you're going to receive a gift or offering for you. Father God, I just pray for my friends in this room. Lord, I know today is a challenging message. You spoke straightforward today, oh God. Lord, I'm asking that you would guide them in their journey what their next step is. Lord, if their faith in you or their perspective of you is not what it should be, Lord, I'm asking just for your grace over them to help them. Help them get it to where it's supposed to be. Be with them. And Lord, I'm praying for those who are making that decision to follow you today. Lord, help them, strengthen them, walk with them. Lord, reveal yourself to them. Surround them with godly people who will help them in their journey. 
silence the voices that are trying to pull them away. Lord, help them to take those next steps into following you, oh God. Step by step, day by day. Just be with them. Lord, right now, I just want to declare you are God. You are God. And you are God over our lives. You are God over this church. And we say yes to you. And as the pastor of this church, I say yes to whatever direction you have for us. And I ask that you would just strengthen us and help us in that journey. Lord, you know our human frailties. Be with us in them and help us to move past them. Lord, I bless your people. Lord, as we go out back into the world this week, that you would just be with us and help us in all things. We love you, O oh Lord. We honor you. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, come on, why don't we give God the best hand clap we can give. Love you guys. God bless you.